All right, so today we're gonna <clears throat> we're gonna pick up with the thyroid. So the thyroid is an endocrine organ that's located in the neck, and it's gonna have multiple lobes, multi lobular 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 multi lobular um, organ. And I want to take a look at the histology uh, of the thyroid. Uh, take a look at the, the tissues that we have. So, thyroid is kind of set right here, kind of just inferior to the Adam's apple. This is the cartil uh, cartilage, the thyroid cartilage, uh, and it has multiple lobes. So, histologically, um, cross section through the thyroid. You're going to have thyroid follicles. You're going to have all of these other cells out here uh, called the parafollicular cells or sometimes the C cells. And then surrounding each of these thyroid follicles is a layer of cells known as the, the follicular cells. Inside of the thyroid fo follicle is uh, what's known as, as colloid. So it's, it's, a, it's a solution that has heavier particles in it. Um, it's co colloid actually means there. You also are going to see evidence of blood supply places where there are blood vessels, etc. Uh, so <clears throat> histologically, it's got a couple different cell types, the parafollicular cells. These are the cells that produce a hormone called calcitonin. Because they produce calcitonin, they're a lot of times just simply abbreviated as the C cells. Then you also have the follicular cells. And the follicular cell is classified as the principal cell. As you can see here, it's this layer that kind of surrounds this, this space. This is in, in the thyroid. If this was in situ or in a living organism, this colloid, would, it, it's a solution, right? Are, are, are you all remembering that term? You had solutions, colloids, emulsions, okay? And so the colloid is just referencing that there's larger particulate inside of this, inside of this, um, this aqueous based solution. And so the follicular cells, they they form the border or the edge of the of the thyroid follicle. They're gonna surround the Okay, so those are the two main cells, calcitonin, and then in the from the thyroid follicle, we're going to see production of T3 and T4. We're going to get to that, um, but before we can do that, we have to understand a little bit of nutrition, and in particular, nutrition or consumption, I should say, of iodine. Surround. Thyroid follicles, follicular cells surround the column. All right, so iodine consumption. Where do I get iodine from in my diet? Salt. Yep, we iodize our salt. You want to get more than salt off the shelf, and it's going to say iodized salt. You can actually buy non iodized as well. Why do we have iodine in our salt? Why do we iodize our salt? Because we need to consume iodine to maintain thyroid function and thyroid health. Okay, so what you're looking at here is the bloodstream over here. This is an I minus right there, okay? So this is your iodine coming in from your diet. And you can see that it's gonna be transported into the thyroid follicular cells. So these are the cells that make up the border. This is the colloid here. There's a bunch of stuff that's happening. 
we end up here inside of the colloid, and a bunch of stuff happens in here, and you can see that we have this pathway that moves iodine in so that iodine can be incorporated into these molecules. All right, so we're going to try to go through this, try to make sense of everything that's going on. So again, we're getting this from iodized salt intake from our diet. And it ends up in the GI tract. So it comes in as iodine, which is going to be a neutral, char a neutrally charged uh, atom. In the gastrointestinal tract, we lose a proton to form iodine. Okay, so we lose a proton or we become reduced. So iodine becomes iodine. We end up with iodide negatively charged in low levels. In the plasma. Okay. So that's kind of what you see. This is kind of picking up the story right here in this figure. This is iodide, our negatively charged ion, iodide. Ion. Now, what you can see is when we get, uh, when we circulate into the thyroid, the follicular cells have this transporter. It is a iodide pump or iodide trap. Okay, so this iodide pump or this iodide trap allows iodide to enter the follicular cells. And you can see that the mechanism here is actually going to be a co-transporter mechanism. A co-transporter. So co-transporter just simply means that we're going to move two different particles. And it can be in the same direction or in different directions. It can be in the cell or out of the cell. And so to take this a little bit further, we're actually going to see that it's a symporter, which means we're moving both particles into the cell in the same direction. So I'm moving sodium into the cell and piggybacked on that sodium, I'm moving the iodine. <clears throat> the way that this works, remember, is that sodium, where is my highest levels of sodium? Inside the cell or outside? Okay, so it's outside the cell. So the sodium actually has a concentration gradient, right? As that sodium flows through the, co the co-transporter, the positive of the sodium attracts the negative of the iodide and pulls it in. And so I'm going to start loading the cell up with sodium, which means I'm going to start to equalize that concentration gradient. And so I also have to have a second mechanism. And that second mechanism is actually not shown here, but there would be a second um, uh, transporter. It would actually be a sodium counter transporter that allows the sodium to be pumped back out. Turns out that co-transporter is going to be our sodium potassium pump. So one of the pumps is our co-transporter, where the iodide piggybacks down the concentration gradient for the sodium. And then we have our counter-transport accomplished by moving the 
potassium into the cell, sodium back out. And because this is against the pervading concentration gradient, we're going to utilize an ATP every time we cycle that. Yeah, potassium. So it's a potassium, sodium potassium pump to maintain the sodium concentration gradient that favors the co-transport of the iodide into the thyroid follicular cell. Okay, so we're starting to load up this cell with iodine. In addition to moving the iodide into the cell, the thyroid follicle cell also genetically produces a massive protein called thyroglobulin. Okay, so you have a gene for thyroglobulin. That gene is turned on to be produced in the thyroid follicular cells. So it's a protein. And I said it's massive. It's 5,496 amino acids. So this is a really, really big molecule. Its molecular weight is 666,000 Daltons. So you have 5,496 amino acids, and of those 5,496 amino acids, 140 of them are tyrosine residues. So this is actually a protein that's being produced to produce or to hold a large number of these tyrosines. We're going to follow these tyrosines through. So what you can see is this massive protein is going to be produced genetically. We end up going through the ER and the GC. It gets packaged up, and then through exocytosis, it's, it's delivered into the colloid solution uh, within the follicle, uh, within the, the, the follicular colloid. So we have the mechanism to bring iodide into the follicular cell. We now have this mechanism of production and exocytosis secretion of this huge, uh, of this huge protein thyroglobulin. Now we also have an enzyme that's called thyroperoxidase, thyroperoxidase. And what thyroperoxidase does is it catalyzes a chemical reaction to oxidize the iodide. So if I Oxidize iodide, what do I get? Yeah, I'm back to iodide now. Iodide readily binds to tyrosines. Okay, so that's a very favorable, energetically uh, spontaneous, energetically favorable reaction. And I have 140 tyrosine residues that the iodine can bind to. Now, thyroperoxidase 
actually will have one or two oxidation reactions that it will catalyze. So just to kind of give you the summary here of what's going on, iodide comes in, it was converted to iodide from iodine in the gut. Iodine is transported in by our sim porter. It actually gets transported across, and we have on the colloid surface of the follicular cell, uh, this is pendrin. So this is just another protein that is a iodine, iodide transporter. Okay, so that moves iodide into the colloid. So we start to collect iodide in the colloid. Then we have that genetic production of our thyroglobulin that gets exocytosed out into the colloid as well. So now I have a thyroglobulin and I have my iodide. This is where the oxidation is going to occur. Okay, so the oxidation is uh, catalyzed by the thyroperoxidants. And we're going to have one or two oxidation reactions that occur at these different tyrosines on the thyroglobulin. When iodine is bound to a tyrosine, you get a molecule referred to as iodotyrosine. So iodotyrosines are poor. And you have one or two reactions that occur. Basically, um, if you remember tyrosine, tyrosine has a carbon ring. And you have two different carbons that become available to bind iodine. If you bind one of them, you get one type of molecule. If you bind both of them, you get a second type, iodotyrosine. Okay? Is everybody sort of following this? I'm about to draw some, some chemistry pictures here, so bear with me. Because this is definitely not my forte. So hopefully you'll remember that your amino acids, they all have a basic structure where you have a central carbon, a hydrogen uh, on, one of the, on one of the covalent bonds, then you have an amine group, NH3, and a carboxyl group, COOH. And that's your basic structure. And then you'll have your R group. Remember this? Yeah. So your R group is what's different. So in the case of in the case of tyrosine, we have a carbon ring. Okay, so this is tyrosine. That's your tyrosine molecule. In the presence of thyro peroxidase, you're going to incorporate iodine. So the iodide is oxidized, and when it's oxidized, it favorably reacts with either um, either of these carbons. I, I forgot uh, hydroxide. Right. Okay, so it favorably reacts with either of those of those, um, of those carbons. Okay. So you end up with does everybody have this? I'm going to scoot up just a little bit. So you have iodine that can be incorporated. So this is we're going to call this the let's call this the first iodine. So that first iodine gets incorporated. And we basically end up with oh man, I really didn't do a good job. I forgot a CH2 here as well. Did you just say yes? Because that's chemistry. Wait, this carbon bond here. Carbon, carbon, ring. Yes. We 
And so we have the iodine now attached. I think I'm drawing that right. Well, I just drew that in shorthand. You, you could put it, put it in here as well, so that you have your four, your four complete covalent bonds. And then C is good. So we got one, two, three, four. So there's, I don't know what we did there. There's something there, I suppose. There's something there. Hydrogen, probably. Um, so is there supposed, there's supposed to be a double bond here, isn't there? <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna put this to the exam and I'm gonna show you what you need to put down. This molecule is called MIT. MIT. It stands for mono iodo tyrosine. Mono iodo tyrosine. So it's basically the tyrosine molecule that's now associated with a single iodine. Then the thyrotyroxidase can do a second reaction to add another iodine. That molecule there, which this is DIT, D I T, which is diiodotyrosine. And what would that be? <laughs> it would be. I guess they didn't ask for a list for that reason. <laughs> That's where I thought you were actually going. I didn't realize. No, I was honestly asking. Just two reactions: monoiodotyrosine and diiodotyrosine. Bit and dip. Okay, so we're still not completely there. This is what's happening over here. You can see that I have basically this tyrosine. Uh, I'm sorry, um, thyroglobulin with all the tyrosines now becoming iodized. And some of them have two iodines, some of them have one iodine. And we go through this process here after oxidation and iodization um, called conjugation. And this is where we begin to produce our final, um, our final hormones for um, release or proteolysis and, and uh, release into the bloodstream. Okay, iodine comes in, thyroglobulin, which is basically just a storage molecule for tyrosines, oxidation, ionization, and then conjugation happens. And what happens with conjugation is I take a mit and a dit and put them together, or two dits and put them together. And so I end up with a molecule that either has three iodines or four iodines. Three is T3, four is T4. Is that it? There you go. So this iod this now iodized thyroglobulin re enters the cell. This happens through endocytosis. And we undergo proteolysis. The 
is I could say that differently to emphasize that it's proteolysis, proteolysis, protein lysis, or protein breakup, cut, cutting up the protein. And so what happens during this proteolysis is that giant um, molecule, thioglobulin, is broken into iodo tyrosine residues. And at the end of proteolysis, we end up, in humans at least, with three different combinations. Yeah, so our big long protein that contains all of these different iodized tyrosines, we start breaking it up, right? We start chopping it up into re iodotyrosine residues, and then these iodotyrosine residues, they start to get put together. And there are three different ways that they get put together um, in, in humans. So three combinations found in humans. Of the three, two of them are really prevalent. And then the third one is less prevalent. And so with our iodotyrosines, you basically have mitts and bits, right? Monoiodos and diiodos. And so one of the combinations is to attach two bits together. So I have four iodines in this molecule. And this molecule is called tetra iodotyrosine. And I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, the tetra iodo tyrosine. Which is T4. And it's actually better known. It's better known as thyroxine. Yeah, so this is all the same name for the, this is all different names for the same, for the same hormone, containing four iodines, two bits conjugated together. It's three and it's supposed to be thyronine because I now have two carbon rings together. Because we've added two two rings together, we've changed our R our R on the um, our R group on the amino acid. Let me make sure I'm spelling it right. Yeah, tetra iodo thyrosine from tyrosine, right? Everybody following me? That spells correctly. I didn't. I put the I put the tyrosine in there. Tetra iodo thyronine 
T4 and thyroxin, and I'm going to draw the structure for you here. Is that? Yeah. It's your It's going to be a pretty good drawing. Has everybody got all of this? The, the comments of all being a biology major, you're not a chemistry major. You don't need to call Fisher and Culture and Hayward for reactions. Huh? Maybe you should learn how to draw these. Not stick with uh, just the abbreviations. If you want to be a chemistry major, then why the heck are you here? Okay, that's all right. You did that to yourself. For the love of the game, I'll give up on my aspirations in life. Yes. Okay, so you have your basic structure there, and then you take and basically add on at that hydroxyl group another another ring. Um, well, it could go to it could be NH three as well. Because it's, it's a protonation is based off is based off of whether it's uh, uh, ionized or not pH right amino acids can come in ionized and non ionized forms. You just have the ionized. Okay, so. That is it, it, which is the tetra, iodo, three and tetra, iodo, three. That common T4 is common. The other combination that we can have is going to be dip plus met. Dip mix. Do what now? I'm not near as worried about the base structure of the amino acid. <laughs> Do what now? Because I'm mixing it up. This is dit, mit, and the names are triiodo thyramine or T3. Okay, so those are the ones that are most common in humans. is mid dip, which is called reverse T3, and is not near as common. So 
the first T3 lower occurrence less than 1% of the iodo, well, the, the hormones in circulation, thyroid hormones in circulation. Basically, structurally here, you're just looking at the the rings and their functional groups are changed. The position of the iodine uh, one versus two is. So iodine comes in from the diet, gets reduced to iodide, gets transported with that symporter with sodium into the thyroid follicular cell. Pendrin passes it off into the colloid. Thyroglobulin is genetically produced and exocytosed into the colloid. We have the iodization, and then we come back out with proteolysis to produce these three different hormones. The first two being the most prevalent, T4, T3, and then reverse T3, less than 1% of what we find in circulation. So we'll stop there, and we'll pick up with how we actually stimulate the thyroid and release these different hormones um, on Monday. <laughs>